Thank you, everybody, for coming to a talk about fiber arts. Uh, I really appreciate that. And also some electronics in Linux and open source, too, uh, but mostly fiber arts. Uh, so uh, my name is Kyle Rankin. Um, hello. Uh, I am a tech author. I used to write for Linux Journal Magazine, written a num published a number of tech books. Most recently, I was uh, chief security officer and president for Purism, who made uh, free software running phone and a laptop and things like that since I'm no longer with them, and right now I'm just sort of looking around looking for the next job. Uh, so if you have an idea, you want to talk to me after, that's great. Um, let's see, what else am I plugging? Uh, I wrote a book in my, my time off uh, about how to write a tech book, so it's very meta. So, uh, yes, oh, well, thank you, fan section. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you want to, if there's a lot of people who are like know tech really well and maybe have thought about writing a book and but they're not sure whether they're you know what 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 it would take so I kind of like did a brain dump of uh, everything my experience in that okay enough about all of that let's uh, get into the talk so brief introduction um, I have a lot of hobbies uh, and and I mean a lot of hobbies and and Every now and then when I talk about this, I'm trying to, and people kind of wonder why, and I think about why is it that I have so many hobbies. And I think really what it is, is I like, th I like the process of learning new things. I like the process of getting new skills, whatever that is. And you get to this, at least to this certain plateau of like, yes, I feel like I have this down. And then you sort of main at least maintain that. And then every now and then a hobby you get, you dive even deeper into. But I tend to dive pretty deep into the hobbies that I get into. Um, so for example, some past hobbies. Um, I got really into barbecuing and then curing meat. So like made my own bacon, um, you know, made some, um, I got as far as curing a holiday ham one time uh, from scratch, which was actually the best ham I ever had. Uh, got really into, I've been into 3D printing for like a 12, 13 years or something like that. I did a scale talk about that a number of years back. Um, I got into really uh, got into playing the banjo. Um, I do a lot of home improvement and got really kind of enthused into plumbing. Uh, most recently, I got into uh, historical mechanical calculators and started collecting those. That was like a deep dive where now, if you were to do a Zoom call with me, you would see behind me this wall. Uh, it's kind of like an antique calculator museum with like a like a lot of you know, you know that kind of stuff. Um, in fact, one of them, I was re-watching It's a Wonderful Life, and we had to pause it, so I'm like, wait, I have that one. <laughs> uh, so, but the thing is, is that like, I got really into um, that, and that goes down a rabbit hole of understanding the history of computing, right? And when you start going into the history of computing, uh, you'll realize there's a lot of crossover with other things. You, start, you eventually land on people like Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace. Uh, and when you start looking into their history about programmable computers, you learn about a man named Jacquard, who invented a loom about a century before that was programmable with punch cards. And when you're someone like me who reads that, then it plants a little seed in the back of your mind, like, okay, looms, weaving, punch cards, that's kind of interesting. Okay, we'll get back to that. So I didn't do um, uh, sourdough bread during COVID, uh, but I did get into weaving. That was sort of my COVID hobby that I dove into for this reason. I, it's sort of like one hobby led to the other one. So a couple of examples of this I got really into it. Uh, so I spent, you know, I have a, a vast library now of mostly out of print weaving books that I've gone through and I get really into the history of it. Um, I actually this last year entered a couple entered a competition for the first time. So there's an example of a, a double weave uh, cotton reversible towel uh, that I submitted to a competition that actually won. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> towels. Um, thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, so like I got really into that sort of technique. Um, uh, most recently, I woke, I woke, I wove a stole made out of silk for my wife by surprise for like Valentine's Day. This is using like an undulating twill for those of you who are weavers. Um, pretty complicated, pa the most complicated pattern I've ever woven and probably the fastest I've ever had to weave because she was gone for a short amount of time. And so I had to really like spend like hours and hours and hours like getting this done before she, she got back for a surprise. All right. Um, but enough about that. So basically that getting into weaving sort of like opened up a world generally into fiber arts as a pursuit. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's a lot of intersections with technology and fiber arts, in particular with weaving and the automation with weaving, but also with knitting. Um, a lot of the automated machines that, uh, that started like the industrial revolution were around automating fabric production, uh, which spawned a, a revolt uh, by people known as the Luddites 
who were revolting against that technology in particular, how that technology was taking uh, control out of uh, the, um, the mo more skilled hands and making and commoditizing it without any alternatives. And there's a actually a really good book that just came out this year called Blood in the Machine that documents the history of that whole thing because traditionally these days when you hear about Luddites, you think of someone who doesn't like technology, and that actually wasn't the case. The people who were, who were uh, around the Luddite movement in, in the UK were actually not afraid of technology at all. They embraced technology, generally speaking, but they didn't embrace how technology took control out of the, um, out of the craftsman's hands and put it into just the owners of the factories. So recommend that read if you're interested in that. Um, that's another diversion, but that's okay. We'll get back into it. Okay, so um, briefly, I was like, man, I really, oh yeah, there's, there's like all these other automated, there's these intersections with technology and fiber arts. And I, and I was like, you know, I saw someone on, on like online on social media post about a computer controlled knitting machine. I'm like, I want a computer controlled knitting machine. That would be really cool. So I kind of started searching for that. Like, man, oh, those are kind of expensive. Oh, well, there's kind of one or two that you can find. Um, there's some flatbed ones that used to be programmed with floppies, but you can then like uh, uh, the uh, craft magazine uh, in combination with Make came up with some interfaces for that. But anyway, that led me to searching on Craigslist like you do, and I found a free flatbed knitting machine. Now, it wasn't an electronic one. It was the previous generation, so it was programmable only with punch cards. Uh, but that's still okay. So now I have this flatbed knitting machine to where, like, we have some people in the middle row doing it the hard way where it takes some time and focus to knit. Whereas with me, it's sort of like one row is <laughs> and then the next row is you kind of go like that. And it's about the size of a Casio keyboard, right? Well, that kind of made me interested in the process of mechanical knitting. Uh, and I was like, that's kind of cool. Uh, and that, again, another seed planted to, s to, to sprout later on. And ultimately, th ultimately, that led me to building a knitting machine clock from scratch. Uh, so this is a story all about how uh, I did that. So um, I named it Tempest Nectit which is the closest Latin I could find to time knits. Uh, and so that's the name of the project. And let's go into it. So this talk in particular, I'm gonna talk about the inspiration to of the project. I didn't conceive of this idea myself. Uh, the design, uh, there's a lot of design elements into this that I, that was the heaviest part of this project for me. Uh, the assembly, uh, which wasn't so bad. Um, set up an installation. So after it was built, how do, how do I set it up and get it ready to go? I'm gonna talk about the 2023 scarf. So this machine knits a scarf every year. Uh, it takes a whole year. Um, it's a pretty long scarf. And I'm gonna talk about uh, some particular highlights of the 2023 scarf. Um, and then talk about some future plans for this machine and for the things that it produces. Uh, and then some closing thoughts. So let's get going with that. So the inspiration uh, was this. This was a Hackaday post that I saw in January of 2023. Uh, an artist by the name of Siren Elise Wilhelmson designed a project clock. So this is like an art project that you'd put in an installation and the way that it worked is it would knit a stitch every half an hour um, and every day it would knit a row. So there was 48 hooks around this circular knitting machine. Every hour, every half an hour do a stitch, which means 48 of those is a row. So that's a full day. After a year, it would drop a completed scarf onto the ground. Okay, and it's sort of like talking it was a commentary on the passage of time, and there's probably some references to um, some, some Nordic tradition as far as like the uh, Valkyries, not the Valkyries, but the Furies and their um, using of looms to stitch people's lives, kind of like the Greek fates. There's a lot of this stuff probably tied into that. Um, regardless of that, I wanted one, um, but there's no build plans. Uh, the thing is, is you could commission the artist, but if whenever you go to a site, whether it's an enterprise vendor um, who, who says, ask us if for pricing, or, or an artist is like, you can commission me. Like, oh, okay, well, never mind, I can't afford that. Uh, but that's okay. So I just, I was like chatting with my wife about it. I sent her a link. I'm like, I want one of these. And she's like, well, you should make one. I'm like, well, okay. okay. Um, that sounds like a good idea. Sure, I got, I got approval and everything. So let's, let's go. <laughs> so the thing is, um, there's no, there were no documents on how to make one of these things, right? Like there was no guide, there's, so I had to figure it out. But the thing is when you think about what this clock was doing, you can break the design down into a couple of components. So uh, the artist clock was a 48, had a 48 hook circular knitting machine. I'm sorry if that font's kind of small, but you can just hear what I'm saying. Uh, so it's a 48 hook circular knitting machine. There's a stepper, it had some sort of stepper motor that was attached to what otherwise the circular knitting machine usually operates by a hand crank, or you can get an attachment to hook a drill up to it, which is kind of sweet. 
Um, but instead of a drill, uh, you could also just hook up a stepper motor. So the clearly there's some sort of stepper motor that controlled that. Uh, some sort of electronics to control the stepper motor. Um, some software that then told the stepper motor to turn one stitch every 30 minutes, right? Um, so I took that as, uh, those are probably how it was made. And so my personal project ended up breaking into a couple of sections. So electronics, so I needed some way to control a stepper motor with some kind of electronics. Um, I needed some kind of software so that I could rotate a stepper a certain amount of steps every period of time based on a schedule. I needed a knitting machine. Um, I, was, I wasn't going to make one of those from scratch. I was going to pick something off the shelf, and there's a couple of, sub, uh, of examples out there that aren't that expensive. And I needed a case. I needed something to put everything in. So that's sort of like the, the breakdown of the project. So let's talk in more detail about each of these. So for the electronics, um, my first proof of concept is, can I control steppers from a Raspberry Pi? Um, whenever my, you know, yes, you can probably do it with Arduinos for sure. Um, that's not really my strength, I have, but I also have tons of Raspberry Pis lying around because you eventually get a newer model to do a thing in your house, and then you have the older model kind of sitting on the shelf. And I'm pretty sure th like this didn't need a whole lot of horsepower to do what it was doing, and Raspberry Pis for Arduino people are already way overkill. Uh, so, but I was like, hey, I bet there's some way to control a stepper motor from a Raspberry Pi, and of course there certainly is. Um, and if I could do that, then I didn't have to get into Arduino programming. I could just use my Raspberry Pi, and I could also easily SSH into it, which is kind of cool, SSHing into your clock. So um, I used an Adafruit motor hat. Adafruit makes this really nice little hat that sits on top of the Raspberry Pi and is designed for controlling both a stepper and, and regular uh, electric motors. Um, so I combined that with, I mean, most of this, there's some purchased things here, but a lot of this was like stuff that I had lying around my house because I'm a geek, and you collect things. So you have the drawer of power supplies where you're like, I'm going to use one of those someday. And everyone's like, you're never going to use one of those. Well, I proved you wrong because <laughs> I did use one of those uh, for this project. But I, so I had a spare Raspberry Pi lying around. I also had a spare stepper motor because I had some spare th old 3D printers lying around, right, um, that were no longer like fancy. I have like a fancier one kind of, and I have these old, old school ones. So like, OK, well I can just take the stepper motor out of there, and it'll probably work. Um, so I just basically followed the motor hat dots. Oh, I didn't mention, I've never worked with stepper motors before. I mean, technically, yes, I used a, a 3D printer. So that uses a stepper. I've never programmatically managed stepper motors. I just had a vague <coughs> sense of some ideas about it and read some docs. Uh, so that was like a, a brief crash course. The motor hat uh, needs something between a 5-volt and a 12-volt power supply. Um, so I went through that drawer that has all those old bricks that you have, and I found both a 9-volt and a 12-volt. Um, there's some things that if you've worked with stepper motors, in particular with 3D printing, that there is a relationship between the voltage and how much power you're going to get out of the stepper motor, but there's also a relationship to the sound. So the more voltage you're going to get more power, but it's also going to be louder. The stepper motor is going to make more noise typically. I mean, they sell s quiet stepper motors and things that are compensate. But I knew that relationship just because I read it one time and it was stuck back here somewhere. And so I, s I was like, well, I have a 9-volt and a 12-volt. Let's see if I can get away with a 9-volt. Also, the brick is smaller. Um, I went with the 9-volt mostly for that reason because the 12-volt power bricks that I had in my, in my drawer were the gigantic ones. Um, so I went with like a 9-volt. It's a little bit smaller. I, I can make the case a little bit smaller. So after that, I had, okay, I could control a stepper motor. It was spinning. I would type a command, and it would spin. Um, SSH into my Raspberry Pi like you do, and it would spin. But the thing is, is I kind of realized as I was doing this, I, I wanted hardware buttons uh, on this thing. And uh, because it would be really useful to be able to control the steppers manually, but in particular, control them manually s without saying, well, all you have to do is SSH into the, the clock and run this Python script. And then you could, uh, you know, I didn't want to have to do that. So I was like, it would be kind of nice if I had two little buttons on the bottom. One would go forward and one would go backward. Uh, there's, I'm sure, I know that Raspberry Pis can do that. Uh, not that I've ever done it before, but I know they can do it. Uh, so I went through my, my stash of conference badge, like electronic badges. You know, if you've gone to enough conferences, you'll see these kits that, like, make your own badge, that kind of stuff. Well, I have, like, a stack of those. And so I went through the stack and, and found one. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's all these great little push buttons in there. I'm sure that would probably work fine. So got that. Um, followed the GPIO guide and learned how to like wire those and all of that stuff, which again, crash course in that, but that was, again, not too challenging. The docs are there. 
So you read the docs, you hook all that, wire that stuff up, and then you have um, hardware buttons. I settled on just two buttons. One would advance forward um, some amount, like about a stitch, and one would go backward about a stitch. And this was also kind of useful for te testing other things. All right, so that's the electronics. Now on the software side, um, basically it's a Raspberry Pi running Raspbian. Uh, I wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. One, Adafruit's examples were all based on that, so I didn't want to veer from that. And also it's just like the simplest approach. I didn't, I'm not trying, I don't need it to be like super lightweight, whatever that would mean for a clock. Um, so it didn't really matter. So I just went with the basics. Uh, I'm glad I did. I needed uh, to write custom software though because I needed to control the knitting machine with very precise steps. I'm trying to move it at just a certain amount and this actually becomes more important halfway through the design process when I get thrown this giant curveball. Uh, so I have to control it precisely. Um, all the examples are in Python. I, do, I did a little bit of Python before that but just like here and there because uh, um, mostly like, and this is also a connection to fiber arts, I, I learned in Perl uh, first. Uh, so that's a knitting joke, sorry everybody. Uh, so, uh, uh, th but then, but you know, cause like Perl and Bash, but, it, so, but this was in Python, so let's learn some Python. So did this in Python. The key though is figuring out exactly how many steps to tell the stepper to move to go forward one stitch. Um, there's not, and it's based on the machine it's hooked up to and a couple of other things and the gear ratios and things like that. So it's not like a, that's not documented. So you basically have to do trial and error. Um, so that's what I did. I found a 3D printed part online for someone who wanted to hook a drill up to their circular sitting mach uh, knitting machine. And I just printed that out and hooked it up to my stepper motor. Uh, there's this nice little trick if you take an aquarium tube and put it over a stepper motor and then kind of squeeze that into the drill hole. Um, it it has provides enough friction and grip that you can c control the, the gear that way. So I did that, hooked it up uh, sort of like in this really hacky way first because there's no case. So kind of hook it up to the kind of have it suspended hanging from the knitting machine um, and do some trial and error, run some scripts and figure out exactly how much I have to move to go a stitch. Um, then I wrote a couple of sample scripts as I was doing this because I wanted to try out a couple of different ways to advance things. So for example, here's a, a script that would advance one stitch, all right? Most of this is relatively straightforward Python, your half of it's importing libraries. Um, and the other half is a single for loop. Uh, you'll see a couple, a lot of commented out examples here. And this is me iterating, I kept this on purpose. This is me iterating through, there's a couple of different ways to control stepper motors uh, with this motor hat. There's a couple of different types of steps. And so in this case, I'm experimenting with a lot of the different ones and some of them require sleeps in between. Some of them don't require sleeps. And I'm experimenting with a couple of things. One, how much power is that step providing because the, the knitting machine, this isn't a high precision knitting machine. This is like a very cheap plastic knitting machine. And so it has a tendency to bind because there's not like high precision between the parts. And so you kind of have to overpower that with like a little bit of extra ohms. And when you're hand cranking, it doesn't really matter. You just kind of like crank a little bit harder but for a stepper. You don't want it to be just sort of stuck. Um, so I experimented with a couple of things there. Um, and so for example, it took a lot of experimentation to find the right type of step to do, the right speed of step, um, and any sleeps in between. Uh, there are what's known as micro steps, which are way quieter. It just makes this loud kind of noise, which is really kind of sweet, although it's also kind of weird. Um, it's, it's more precise um, in terms of compared to some of the other stepper types, but it's also way weaker. And so I ultimately ended up going with, well, there's also a single type of step. It's called a single step, which is way stronger, louder, um, but again, more powerful. Dub and there's a double step, which is um, even stronger and also even louder. I ended up uh, noticing when I was doing this, I would s it would skip sometimes when actually, with just the knitting machine by itself with no yarn in it, I could use uh, some of the weaker skip some of the weaker stepping types and it would go through and it would go through fine. I could like knit whole, go through whole uh, circles, uh, cycles through it. But when I started putting yarn in, that added just enough tension, especially at the very beginning when you're first casting on, that it would start binding. So I realized I'm gonna need more powerful steps. And at first you could kind of get around that by sort of forcing it through and then once it, it was a little bit better, but I found I needed to get one thing. I needed to do the most powerful step I could. I also ended up buying a more powerful stepper. So I just went online and found like a, a equivalent stepper. Like with 3D printers nowadays, you can find these steppers very easily online. Um, and found one that was rated to be stronger. And I, I have links later for this. I settled on the double step, which is the strongest but also loudest step um, with a short sleep in between. 
and that combination, you can kind of control the volume a little bit by how long you sleep in between each time it tries to move the, the motor. So then I needed to somehow programmatically control this. So I first I considered a cron job. This seems like the perfect use for a cron job because I want to do a thing every half an hour or every hour or whatever. Well, that's what cron was made for. Uh, but I also added those hardware buttons. And so that means I, ne I needed some sort of daemon already that was sitting there in a loop listening for uh, button events so I could trigger uh, actions based on that. So since I already had a daemon that was al always going to be running, I decided to combine that daemon for button control with my, uh, with my clock, essentially, everything that controlled the clock. Um, I ultimately wrote this daemon that runs in an infinite loop. I sent a link here. It's actually longer than it'll fit on a page, and you can just click on it if you're interested. Um, and it runs in this infinite loop. At first, when it very at the very beginning of the loop, it, uh, it checks the time. If it's at the very top of the hour, um, then it moves the stepper forward uh, one increment, whatever that ends up meaning. Um, what I ended up doing is not just move forward, but I also started, I noticed it was, whoa, it got louder here. Um, I also noticed I needed to move backwards a little bit first to kind of sometimes help it unstick. Because again, this isn't a high precision machine. So every now and then it would kind of bind. And I noticed if I went backward a little bit first before I went forward again, it kind of would loosen things up. And so um, that helped. And so I added that in. Uh, the other thing I decided to do was instead of doing the entire step for one, for one hour together, um, so instead of just going like, I, what I did was I split it up to chime the hour. So what I mean by that is, yes, 1 o'clock would go, but like 3 o'clock would go, and so the idea was uh, you could be, well, it's kind of loud. You could literally be in another part of the house, and you would just sort of hear, you would hear it start, and you're like, oh, wait. Oh, it's 6 o'clock already. Okay. Um, so you could actually hear the chime uh, based on how, how it did that. And I was back and forth about doing that, but I'm kind of, I, I like that I did it now, so I, we kept it. Um, after it chimes um, and advances a stepper, it sleeps for 61 seconds. That's on purpose so that it, there's, no, there's no possibility that it could go back into the beginning of the loop and chime again at the top of the hour because it will have at least be one minute after the top of the hour at that point. Um, otherwise, if it didn't chime at the top of the hour, then it, then it looks and detects button presses and acts based on those. I also added a very simple system to Unifile uh, that runs this automatically at boot, so there's no, I don't have to deal with this at all. I can just sort of plug it in, um, and it starts up, and it gets the time from the Internet, and then gets going. All right, so now I have electronics. I have software. Uh, I need a knitting machine of some kind. Uh, here's, here you go. Here's a prototype. Um, I started with the Centro 48 hook knitting machine. This is a pretty inexpensive clone of uh, some more expensive circular knitting machines that are out there that are plastic, like um, Addy, I want to say, uh, makes one that is very popular. It's it's about three times as two or three times as expensive, but there's you get what you pay for. Um, this is pretty cheap, so I and this is a fun project, so uh, I went with that. Uh, the other thing I wanted was I wanted the machine hook count uh, to match the machine hook count in the original project. Now, why does that matter? Uh, it makes sense as a clock. So if you think about it, uh, if you have 48 hooks, then that means in a d and you want a row a day, then it makes sense to chime every half an hour. Then that way you get 48 chimes or 48 stitches every day. So it's easiest to calculate that with 48 hooks. You know that every half an hour it, uh, it advances one hook and then keeps going. Um, I, well I just said that slide. So. Uh, my uh, my original plan was to basically use a back and mount everything to the back, some sort of backer board, and then build a wooden frame around it, kind of like a birdhouse design. And the reason that that made sense, one, the original project did that, but the other reason it made sense is you have the circular knitting machine, and there's a stepper motor sticking out of it at some place. And so it makes sense to, to have like mostly a box around the, the round object and then wherever the stepper motor sticks out to build a little roof over it to, so you can obscure and hide that stepper motor. Um, so I copied that design and went with that. Originally was just going to get out the woodworking tools and, and start making that. So, I mean, uh, you know, things progress pretty quickly here. Uh, you start diving deep into one of these projects and with you know, two-day shipping on most of the things that I didn't have, uh, from the start, I had everything completed in about two weeks from like 
conception, like seeing the Hackaday post, getting approval, um, to like going through buying every buying the knitting machine and prototyping and writing the software, and I have like a, a finished project, and you can actually see that stage of that project right there in that picture. Um, but I put it on the board. I put it on a kitchen table. And both my wife and I look at it like, look what I did. And so we both kind of look at it, and we both, you know, walk around and look at it, and we're like, this is giant. I mean, this it, it, the knitting machine itself, the 48-hook knitting machine is about this big. Um, and by itself, it seems like, well, that's kind of big, but if it's on the wall, it's not going to be, you know, there are clocks that big. You've seen the big face clocks. But that's one thing. It's another thing when you imagine the big wooden birdhouse that you're about to build around this thing. And you're like, that's that's too big. Uh, that's that's crazy. So that's not going to work. And we both realized that. I'm like, because uh, I was going to have this really sweet thing where, like, look, I finished this. I from start to finish, like, three weeks, and I built this uh, crazy project. So not going to happen. All right, back to the drawing board. So take two. What do we do? Turns out Central also makes a 22 hook machine. That's a lot cheaper. It's a lot smaller. Um, the main the bigger knitting machine was kind of is designed to automate the making of things like hats or you can make like big panels to stitch into blankets and things uh, the smaller one is more aimed for like socks or small scarves I guess you would say um, it's much smaller it's like half the price you can get one if you shop around for about thirty five dollars which is even more within budget of I'm doing this project with no practical use in my house kind of thing um, but twenty two hooks messed up the whole thirty minute stitch plan. And 22 hooks is not, you know, well divisible into anything related to, like, a, a base 12 system, thanks Sumerians. But that's just how it, how it goes. Uh, so what I did instead of a half an hour chime is I went with an hourly chime. Uh, and, the cool th and I went through a couple of design questions with that. Like, okay, if I do an hourly chime, do I just divide an entire row um, – an entire row of a stitch, like an entire s uh, circumference around, with uh, a day. So every day, does it do one knit, uh, knit one row, or does it, or do I make it match the hour? I decided to have it match the hour, and I'm glad I did. So what I bas what I mean by that is, so on this knitting machine, there's a bunch of hooks, and there's these little hook covers, and they're all like the same color. I took some foil tape and marked one with a shiny piece of foil to mark the hour hand. All right, so every hour. Like, if it's straight up and down, it's midnight or noon. At 1 o'clock, it advances to the 1 o'clock position. Like, at 3 o'clock, it's, you know, on the side on, I guess, what, facing you, it would be east. Um, so anyway, it does that just like a clock would. Well, to do that means it has to do two rows in a day. So, But it also meant I could go look at the clock and know what, what time it was within uh, an hour of it being accurate. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> which doesn't sound that useful, uh, but, well, and plus I already have the chime, so I kind of can hear it from literally anywhere in the house because uh, the, the resonance of this thing is kind of crazy. But, but the other thing that was useful was I would also know if I'm losing time. Like, for example, if, I lose, if, I, if it bound at some point in the middle of the night or when I was away or whatever, I could see just sort of like if you have a clock and you haven't perfectly tuned the pendulum. In the olden days when you had mechanical clocks, uh, that you would have to tune them from time to time I guess based on listening to the church bell ring, and then you would like line it up, right? Uh, so in this case, I, could, I do the same thing. Like I walk around, it's like, wait, it's six o'clock, um, but it doesn't say six o'clock, so then I could like adjust the time. So it's kind of useful to do that hour uh, hand with foil tape. So yeah, two full rotations per day as a result. Uh, the another problem was the Central 22, so the Central 48 knitting machine basically sits on these four little plastic feet. It sort of sits above everything. And all I really had to do, and they, they were removable, so all I had to do was remove those feet and replace them with posts, and I could mount it to whatever board I wanted to. Very easy uh, to deal with. I didn't really even have to take the machine apart other than removing these little removable plastic feet. No problem. Because what I, I like the idea of this being reversible if I wanted, to, wanted it to be. Um, but the Central 22 has a completely different case design, um, one that doesn't allow you to do that. So the only way I could mount it to something was to take it apart. Um, and when I took it apart, I couldn't just easily, there's a lot of, the outer case makes certain assumptions that uh, the inner case makes some assumptions that the outer case is there to hold things in place. And so you can't just take the, the mechanism out and have it work. 
which I found pretty quickly. Um, so I disassembled it to mount it to, to the wood. What I realized because of that is I would need to add some structural elements underneath this mechanism so I could mount it to something and have it be uh, up high enough that you know the, the scarf could come out of the bottom and all of that. Uh, and so I'd have to design something and maybe 3D print it or something to kind of do this. In the process of doing that, um, I realized, well, I have to think about the case. Well, what I realized is when I took this machine apart out of its case, it actually fit on the bed of my 3D printer. Uh, where the previous one did not. It was way bigger. I'm like, huh, so this fits on my 3D printer bed, you say. Uh, I wonder if I could just forego this whole woodworking project and maybe uh, 3D print a case for this. Uh, so yeah, totally an option. Uh, the only problem was I didn't really have any 3D modeling experience. Now, now for sure, I had been 3D printing for like like I said, 12 plus years now, I've had 3D printers for a long time, but I've never actually made my own stuff. I always use somebody else's design for things. Um, but I decided, well, let's just do what you do. Uh, the solution was a three to four week crash course in 3D modeling uh, using Tinkercad, what, like you do. Um, and you can see here, here's a picture of one stage of the case, the bottom part of the case here. Um, so what I it's an iterative process. I got a pair of calipers and started measuring things. I started prototyping sections at a time. So for example, the orange piece in that picture is the part that the main knitting machine mounts to. That was one of the most critical parts to get right and had the, the most need for precision uh, for how it was fitted. So what I would do is basically design everything, but designed it that separately first, printed that out a few times and got the fit just right. Because ultimately what you're seeing there is one giant part. Um, I didn't want to start fastening a bunch of individual parts together if I didn't have to. Um, just let the printer fuse it all together. Like I said, the most critical part was the machine mount. Everything else would sort of fit around that, but if the obviously if the machine didn't fit well, then you're kind of lost. That's, that's the key to this design. So like the other one, I decided to mimic a birdhouse. Uh, the way it was designed is the, the, the back part or the bottom part is the part that is against the wall. Everything would mount against that, and then I would put some sort of cover on the front and a roof on top, kind of like a birdhouse, for the same reason I said. Uh, the top itself would split into three sections, so I made this little cha design channel, so it would slide down um, in place, and then the, the top would sort of slide into place, and so it would cover the front, um, but it was in three sections, whereas the bottom case was one big piece. Uh, the reason I did it this way is it allowed me, this design let me take every all the top part out and mess with the electronics without disturbing the knitting in progress. Because I figured, I knew for the mo if I didn't design this in, I promise you like sometime in June, in halfway through a year, there would be some sort of problem with some electronics somewhere. I would need to take it apart and I would have to dis take the whole scarf out. So this allowed me, I can put the scarf kind of back into the knitting machine and or the yarn into the knitting machine and take the whole surface off and get access to everything if I need to, to make a, a fix. So 3D printing. Uh, here's a picture of my, uh, my bottom case in progress. Uh, it took two days to print, uh, pretty big print. It completely filled the print bed, like to the point that the skirt that you normally would print around, I didn't print around because it, would, it exceeded the size of the print bed. So it like literally filled up the print, it was as big as it could be, um, but fit fairly. Um, it took three prototypes to perfect, because uh, 3D printing, and it was the kind of thing, and this is after doing other iterations, so this means it took a two-day process that you would then get, and you'd put everything together, like, oh, great, that's, man, this is looking really sharp, and you would start putting things together, like, oh, oh, that hole is supposed to be here, like, there's a two millimeter difference to where this hole is supposed to be, and I measured everything, but it's not right. Okay, well, let's take two. Um, but that's okay because what you would do is there's certain bugs you would find in the design that you're like, well, it doesn't really matter. Um, I can live with that. But then you'd find some massive mistake and like, okay, cool. Then I can bring in all the other mistakes, a lot like with software releases. Uh, and you can like squeeze it all together and, and ship it all out. So in addition to the bottom case, I designed a couple of extra parts. So I had to design plastic button covers because you have these little electronic uh, buttons, push buttons. Well, I wanted to have basically a little tube uh, that wasn't just a tube, but that would sit inside the case, the bottom of the case, and protrude so you could push it, and it would ultimately push the button underneath. I had to design some clips. There's a ring gear inside of this knitting machine that actually does all the magic. 
um, and you needed, I needed some clips that would hold that to the case because it wants to float and it, it's expecting, it's old case I took it out of is it, it has these little channels in place. So I had to replicate that with some clips, um, some standoffs to mount the Raspberry Pi uh, to the case. Um, I needed a spool to hold the yarn and figure out where I wanted that to be. Um, and all of this, is I have a project printables page. So if you wanted to make one of your own, you can just download all of those designs and print it yourself. All right, so assembly. The full installation steps are on my project page. You can totally make one of these. Uh, this, like the hard work's already done. So all you, all you have to do is follow steps. And I'm a technical writer on the side. And so I wrote like a 4,000 word, fully detailed step-by-step -step professional, to my opinion, uh, document, documenting the whole process. All the code's there, all the design files are there. Everything's there, so you can just follow step by step and have one of these in your house. Um, full bill of materials is right there. Many of these things you might already have, except for maybe the knitting machine, but if you do, that's sweet too. Um, the rest of it is pretty easily accessible. I didn't want to get anything that was too hard to find for the project. And again, most of this I found around my house. All right, so the bottom case, assembly. Looks kind of like this, uh, fully assembled. So basically everything attaches to the bottom case, like I said, and then the lid slides on. So I started with the Raspberry Pi first. A lot of this has to do with access to screws to get things in and everything. So the Raspberry Pi gets mounted first, then the knitting machine, then the motor. Once the knitting machine's in place, then I can slide the stepper motor in and get that uh, attached. And then the motor hat goes in. Uh, and then uh, the push buttons go in next. And I designed this, I think it's kind of neat, a w a way to slide the buttons in so that they would slide in, not pop out. And y if you looked at the design, you'd see like, wow, Kyle, like <laughs> nicely done, <laughs> nicely done. I'm like, yeah, I know it's my first time designing anything. So thank you for your, uh, yeah. But um, then uh, mounted the AC outlet, uh, did a lot of zip ties because that's what you do. Uh, fasten those, in fact, the design features like little slots in the back where the zip ties go through so you can bind everything nicely. Tidied up the cable management because I'm a sysadmin and that's very important. Um, all right, so bottom case done. And, and actually, you, you would think you could test it with that, but you can't really because the top, wants the top uh, pink piece on here wants to float. And you need to actually push it down. The top case keeps it in place. So the top case uh, looks like this separated. You can see there's three different parts. Um, the, uh, I just said that, split into three parts. I had to do it this way because the full thing would not fit on the 3D printer bed. Again, the bottom case fills up the bed. So I had to split it up into three parts just to be able to print it. That's one reason. But there's another reason. Um, well, I'd split it for easier access to electronics as part of it. But the other thing is the bottom cover has a different print orientation than the roof. Just so if I even if I could fit it all in the same print bed, to print it all as one piece would mean I w something would have to have crazy support material underneath it. And that's a huge waste. I didn't want to do that. There's already a little bit of support material for the roof. Um, but for the most part, this print was designed with either built-in support material. For the bottom case, there's this little um, arch that the scarf comes out of that I did add. I, I added uh, support material in the design for. And everything else, um, like I said, you can mostly print it without that. Uh, said that. All right. So now we, we printed out the top case. Uh, so to put this into place, uh, at first it would seem like, and I designed it so that it would just slide in. Uh, and it could accept that this uh, knitting machine always has one hook sticking straight up in the air. And so there was no really good way when you're sliding this down, there's always a hook that's way in the way. All the other hooks are down, but there's at least one hook that's really high in the air. So the only way to get this on was at an angle. So basically you would um, have to slide this sort of in at an angle and then you could sort of flex the plastic a little bit and kind of get it in the next channel and it would sort of lock in place and you could slide it back down into place. Um, like I said, the hooks were, I didn't think about that part when I was first designing this. Like, oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. There's always going to be a hook sticking up. But I found a workaround and that was all right. Um, this particular part of the case is important because the plastic hook covers just float with gravity and gravity is not going to be its friend when it's mounted on the wall. Uh, and so it kind of has to hold in place. If you don't have that in place and you start doing test prints or test uh, runs with yarn, uh, it'll, it'll start flopping all over the place and it'll start dropping stitches, which is like the worst. Uh, so um, after that, there's the B and C part of the case. So uh, let's talk about B first. 
uh, this is, has the name of the project on it, which I thought was kind of cool. And I also tried to do like, a, like an ancient Greek kind of thing, like the U is a V and all of that, right? Because it kind of, it had this sense of, of, like, a, of uh, like a column, like a stone project, right? Um, plus it's in Latin, so what do you get? Well, it's Roman, but anyway. Um, so the other thing I did was I, I was able to use two, t two colors to make the text more visible. It was visible kind of if you just did a single color, but I liked having the, ba the black on the background and then switch to the white because um, it, it made the text pop. And so I'm pleased with that result. Um, and also the middle piece covers up the join between the two other pieces. If I only had a, a main piece and then the roof, you would see this line across it um, where the two join, regardless of how nice the join was, there would be some sort of visible line, and I didn't, like aesthetically, I didn't like that. So the fact that I have a nameplate um, intentionally kind of covers up the join between the other two pieces, and it makes it look cleaner. Um, the C part, it's basically, you can see here that there's a stepper sticking out of the top, right? And so I wanted to do something to cover that up, and so that's the roof part. Um, it sort of basically just slides over and covers the stepper motor is, is the main purpose and act makes it look, like I said, like a lot of some like cuckoo clocks and things that look like a birdhouse. So here's what this looks like assembled. I also have it up here for those of you physically here. Um, in the front, you can check it out later. Um, and you can see here it is assembled and set to midnight slash noon. So you can kind of see the little shiny foil there. All right, so now it's built. Now I need to actually install this thing. So you start by casting on waste yarn, which this basically you want to get some sort of yarn that you're not going to use for your final scarf. There's a number of reasons for that I won't get into here, but basically the knitting machine instructions go through all of that. If you, like even the sparsest instructions explain how to add some waste yarn, a, a number of rows to kind of get this the scarf started. And then after that, you switch over to your, your real yarn you want to use for your scarf. Uh, after about 10 rows or so, I had that all set up, um, and I had then I added about 10 more rows of my regular yarn, and then I ran a script, um, because here's the thing, is I, I was inspired by this project in January of, of the year, of 2023, and at first I thought, well, cool, I'll get it done before the beginning of the month, but again, it took a couple extra weeks to learn 3D printing, 3D modeling, and do all that stuff. So it, was ended, it ended up being sometime around March, uh, early March, when I finally got this ready to go, well, I just missed like three months. So I needed to advance, I wanted to document the year. So I had to, had to basically add that to the year. But I also wanted to document events, I'll get into that. But so what I did was I ran a script that simulated a day. So I would just run that so I could, I made sure I didn't like have it be incorrect. Uh, and it was, so here's the script um, in Python to, to simulate a full day. It's basically just like doing an hour chime kind of, except it just does it all at once. Um, and it's really cool. I have a like I have a video on my side of it going when I was doing this, and it's just like, <laughs> you know, it's pretty awesome um, to see it all in work. And I mean, honestly, even if you didn't want to make a clock, if you were just a super lazy knitter, uh, you could do this project and just like do a scarf automatically using this in like I don't know, like ten minutes maybe at most. You cast on and then just run scarf script py. And it would just like, and you would have a scarf at the end, which is pretty sweet. Um, all right. So my idea behind this was, wasn't simply that, oh, this is kind of cool. I also wanted to document our life. I, I really got into this idea of having an individual scarf not just be this thing that talks about the year, but actually document our year. And so um, here's a, here it is on the wall. And here it is with the majority of 2023 hanging from the bottom of it. I noticed I had to add a hook uh, because it, I started the hook around the time it got to cat height um, <laughs> in, my <laughs> in my house um, and then would constantly adjust it as it got longer and got down back into the cat danger zone. I would just bring it back up. But if the, here's the problem though. If it's not free hanging, what's going to happen is you're getting twists in it, right? Like every day it adds like two twists to it. And that's fine. I've, I found I could survive about a week's worth of that. Um, before it got so twisted, it was a problem. So you ended up having to take the whole scarf off the hooks and untwist it. And what I ended up doing is like twist it the other way a little bit. Uh, so I'd have a little bit of a buffer. Uh, so I didn't have to do it as much. So I decided that we would mark notable events, good and bad, with colored stripes in the scarf. So the base background of the scarf would be black. And then anything notable that would happen, like things, birthdays, anniversaries, things like that, or, or holidays, we would mark with colored stripes in it. So you could look over the scarf and see your year. 
Uh, well, it turns out uh, it was a pretty eventful year for me, 2023. So for example, the scarf documented uh, major holidays, so birthdays, anniversaries, like Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, things like that. Um, awards and residencies that, like my wife won a couple of notable things and we documented that with these cool little stripes to kind of mark the event. Um, my layoff <laughs> for my job seemed like a notable event, so that had a stripe. Um, Related, we took like a three a three plus week a road trip around the country, about nine thousand miles, uh, starting from California, went up to Maine, as far up as Maine, and then went down to Georgia, then went back, so it sort of lapped the country. And so, if you see in that picture, there's a really long yellow section, and that's what about three plus weeks looks like um, in the scarf. <laughs> uh, a lot of pre twist, so like I heavily pre twisted. Um, and then, like, let it, then it was it was enough that it was all right. Um, also documented a stroke. A member of my family got had a, my mother uh, got a str had a stroke that year, uh, which was interesting. Um, related. Uh, also documented a giant road trip to move my mother across the country uh, to live closer with family. Uh, also documented a death in the family. So this is like you don't know this when you're making a scarf, but <laughs> that's documenting the year. And I don't know whether you're talking about like. Um, again, Icelandic fates that uh, control your life with, with thread. But it's kind of interesting to see your life uh, documented in a physical, tangible fabric form. Here's what it looks like. Um, all set up. I split it in, I split it in the quarters uh, so you can kind of get a sense of where it was. It starts at the top. The, the little brown stretch is like a, a short road trip that we took. I'm not going to go through all of these. We actually plan to, we, have, we meant to do it earlier to get like little tags and tag all this because we're already starting to forget some of them we're going to have to go through our calendar um, and and see what things were uh but yeah and you can see the giant road trip um in the second half there um and then a lot of like i said a lot of other little colored stripes and all of that was just from my yarn stash if you are into knitting or weaving or anything you end up collecting a lot of yarn uh, over time and so when a, an event was upcoming we would basically i just bring in a couple of the giant bins of yarn and go through and like, okay, well, what color really signifies this particular event? Like, like Christmas was, I, I found some red and green yarn and kind of twisted it together and then had that. And I started figuring out around how much yarn I needed for a day's worth of a stripe. Um, it ended up being about like a meter, meter and a half of yarn for, for that. It's surprising because it's looping so much. And so I would figure that out, wrap it around my finger, put it on, put it on the little mechanism and go. Oh, we're doing okay on time. So, so the question is, how do you join it? So uh, there's documentation on like the, the circular knitting machines on how you do, how you change yarn out. Basically, you don't, you overlap it. Now, some people, this is controversial, you kind of waited into like a VIE Max thing. So there are some, uh, you didn't know it, and it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I, I don't take sides on the debate. I'm just going to explain both sides. Uh, so there are, certain, there are certain people who believe you should never have a knot in your knitting. Um, and there are other people that believe it doesn't matter whether you have a knot in your knitting. And so the people who are fine with having a knots in knitting would say that you would tie a knot between those two to secure them. Other people who are not a fan of having knots in your knitting would say that you don't. You, <laughs> you lay them over the top of each other perhaps and then you can weave them in. There's other techniques that you can use to secure them. But frankly speaking, they're not going to really come loose. Um, so it's not that big of a concern. You might crochet them in or do so. There's other things you can do to secure them if you're worried about it. So depending on which side of that holy war you fall on, you might uh, add a stripe in a different way. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, and so if you don't want to do it the right way, that's your choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's your scarf, right? Um, all right. So that was – that. Yeah, oh. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you just yeah, you yeah, you Yeah, you just plan you you, al you always have to plan for emergencies. So you you <laughs> yeah. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that was 2023. Now it's 2024. I have a year's worth of learning 
uh, and using this, this machine and documenting my year. So uh, what are some of my plans for it? Uh, one thing I did uh, part of the way through the year is I tweaked how much it slept in between each step to make it a little bit quieter. Uh, so both pro and con, I put this in my living room uh, because it's a great conversation piece. People come over to visit and they're like, what in the world is that? And then you, 10 minutes later, they understand, and some slide deck, they understand <laughs> like, uh, like what that is. They're like, oh, well, well that's, that's cool, Kyle. Nice, nicely done, Kyle. <laughs> Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Um, so, but the, so that's really cool. But the, the one slight, slight downside to having it in the living room is that it does chime on the hour. And um, the box makes a pretty good resonator. And it's not that step promoters are, are quiet anyway, but step promoter is actually not exactly the problem. The problem is the mechanism because it's not a precision device. It's like plastic that's kind of floating around in negative space and kind of can move and wiggle a little bit. So when you use this, especially quickly, it's loud. It's kind of loud. And then the box kind of like amplifies that sound a little bit. So the first couple of weeks, we would be watching TV and then it would strike eight o'clock and you everyone would kind of jump. Um, but by like, you know, April or May, we, we didn't really notice it as much anymore. We mostly just sort of like, <sighs> And then back, you know, go back if we miss something important or otherwise, just like whatever. Um, but it was still kind of cool. It's still going to live in the living room, but it is a little loud. But then again, if you have like clocks that chime, that's a thing you have to deal with anyways. They're going to chime on the hour anyway. So, but I did make it a little bit quieter by changing the sleep amount. And that did change the vibration enough that it was actually markedly quieter. Um, I also noticed, and this is not fixed yet, uh, the ring gear that came with the, the actual knitting machine wore down in a place. Basically, as there was a little bit of bounce up and down, the 3D printed gear was like nice. Um, but the ring gear was cheaper plastic, I think, and not as hard. And so when I took off the scarf and started examining things um, at, at the end of the year, I noticed like a lot of little white plastic in the bottom of the machine. I'm like, huh. And that explains why I would get it stuck at a certain time of day. Like I would notice like, huh, sometime between eight and nine o'clock, um, it always just sort of stick and bind like there's a, and you're troubleshooting this without thinking, without looking at the machine, but there's, there's a couple things that are, that probably is, and it's probably a, a worn ring gear and it was. So I need to replace that. Um, ultimately I will probably 3D print one, but for the first step, what I plan to do is just get another machine. This one, this is wasteful kind of, I don't like this, but get another machine, get the ring gear out, replace it, and then use the broken ring gear to template my 3D printed ring gear for the future. Because then I can just take my time. Because what I don't want is this to be off the wall for like a month while I'm trying to figure that out and losing time. So I'll probably do that uh, sometime this year. Uh, in the meantime, uh, what I do is, and you can tell this is happening because of the hour marker, right? So I can look and like, oh, it's stuck somewhere between 7 and 8 o'clock again. And it's 11 o'clock now. So uh, what I do is I basically just grab the ring with my hand, like a combination lock, and just sort of go. You know, and you just twist it, and it works fine. You sort of twist it in place, and you twist it to the right time. Just, again, a slightly more violent version of what you would do with a, a mechanical clock that's out of time, right? You just sort of gently move the little hour, or the, the min minute hand over into place. I just do that with my hand. Um, and that works for now. It's a little annoying, uh, but it works for now. Um, I've noticed I never actually use the buttons. I think mostly because I noticed I could just grab the machine and just sort of move it where I wanted to go. Uh, that I never, I never use those little buttons at the bottom, uh, which did complicate the design quite a bit. I mean, it's neat, uh, but I never actually use them. So if I were to do this again, I probably wouldn't add the buttons to the design because it's. I mean, if I were, if I were going to sell this as a product to all four people who want one, <laughs> to want to pay good money for one, um, then I would probably add the buttons. Uh, but but otherwise, I probably wouldn't. All right. Also, there's a 2024 scarf in progress. If you come up here, you can see, see it. We already have some interesting stripes, like our whole family got COVID. That was pretty cool to put in. Um, so that's documented. And you'll have to check with me next year to see what other fun things happened in 2024 that we have in the scarf. Um, ultimately, one of our plans for this is we might, when we have enough years, we might stitch all of these into a blanket. I, I really like the idea of like if it was a round number like a, like a decade or something, it'd be kind of cool or something like that where at the end we have this blank.
All right. So uh, let me see. Where was I before? All right. So yeah, I'm going to make a blanket. If you didn't see that on the, you didn't hear me say that. Um, all right. Closing thoughts. So this was inspired by Hackaday. It actually got featured in Hackaday, which is like this really cool full circle thing. I was like super excited about that. Um, they also like clocks a lot on Hackaday. If you if you follow that, it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, so it was featured on Hackaday, which is neat. Um, here's the thing: is my clock. You could say my clock was made from scratch, but but not really. If you look at it, um, like I made it, but not. I didn't really make it exactly because the thing is, is like open source tools made this entire thing possible. Like this wasn't anything I invented at all. Like this was me taking this and this and this and this from the open source store um, and gluing it all together uh, with other open source glue and then having a thing. Uh, so everything from like the Raspberry Pi to the Ad Adafruit hat to the open source scripts and the prototypes that I used that copied and pasted in and modified and all of that is all like other people's work and it's all open source and available for everybody to use. Um, because of that, because I didn't have to learn how to um, design a circuit board to control a stepper motor from scratch and fabricate it. I didn't have to learn all these other nuances. I was able to go from like, hey, I kind of want one of those. Oh, you should make one. Okay, cool, I'm gonna make one. Uh, to like having an actual functioning prototype in two to three weeks, right? Uh, the only reason I was able to do that was because there's all of these projects out there where people have already done the work and, and are willing to share their knowledge, share their code, um, share all these examples so that someone like me who only knows a little bit about a lot of different things can learn more about one of those things um, by following their examples. So it's true, I had to learn new skills, but, those, but all that was possible because the community is willing to share their knowledge. So I didn't, again, I didn't have to learn all this stuff from scratch. Everyone was willing to tell me, oh, you want to control a stepper motor? Well, a billion of us have done this already. Just do these things and you can do that. And it wasn't so bad because, again, I had great examples and plenty of guides. So in the end, what I want to sort of leave you with the thought of is that open source uh, software makes hard, almost impossible tasks accessible to non-experts. I'm certainly not an expert in pretty much any of the things that I, <laughs> that I do, I guess, um, but I'm pretty competent in those things, in particular because there's really good documentation for things. I'm, I like learning things, so I'm, I have, I have the, what I bring to the table is a motivation to learn the thing, um, and what the world provides in return is like all of this knowledge that people are willing to share and examples and everything else. Um, and that's true for all of you too. I mean, I th I'm sure that you felt that when you want to do something new and you look around and you realize, okay, well, other people have at least gone 90% of the way there and I just need to add that little extra bit. And then hopefully you're sharing that extra 10% with the rest of the world. So the next person needs to take your idea and move it a little bit can. Uh, thank you very much and I'll take some questions. <laughs> and since I'm doing the secondary, the, the failover mic here, what I'm gonna do is you, you can talk to me and then I will repeat your question. Uh, so go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, it's a leap year, so that means there's going to be an extra day. Is there any appreciable difference? The appreciable difference is going to be there's going to be two extra rows in the scarf. Now, I don't pretend that this is so precise that my current scarf, if you were to count it, it would have probably documented every single day because there's a, a thing here and there where something messed up or whatever and went on a trip, maybe it bound. And sometimes when it binds, you're like, I think I caught this in time to just rotate um, 12 hours. Uh, but sometimes, you know, so in the end, if I make a blanket out of it, if we take this scarf and the 2024 and 2023 scarves, they're going to probably be more than just two rows different anyway. So, yeah, thank you. Had another question? Yes. Have I th the question is, have I thought about automating weaving? Um, I love the idea of doing that. I've seen one, there's one or two projects out there where someone has done that, where what they did was they took kind of a production, uh, a production loom that had a fly shuttle. So a fly shuttle, uh, for those of you who don't weave, if you've seen people weaving, they, they throw a thing black back and forth and that's called a shuttle. And like the space shuttle's named after that. Like basically everything that you do in life is probably comes from the fiber arts or one of these other ancient crafts, right? You don't realize, or, s or sailing. Right, you don't realize how all of this terminology, for example, in this front row, this is the heckling row, right? <laughs> well, so the reason, 
that we call it heckling is that if you are pro uh, producing linen, uh, the way that you do that is you grow flax and then you let that rot for a little bit and then you take the outer shell out and you take this tool that has all these little needles sticking out of it and you scrape the inside of the flax and it separates the inner fibers from the outer. You use those inner fibers, you twist those into linen uh, thread. Well, that tool is called either a hackle or a heckle. So when you are heckling somebody, that term means that you are needling them uh, with this tool that's stu stuck with needles. Anyway, that's a whole other talk. Uh, um, but yeah, so there's, there's, a couple of t there's a couple of projects that took a fly shuttle uh, that goes back and forth by pulling a string. And uh, this person actually worked in a production, at, on a production loom for a while that just was fully automated. And they added like servos and a couple of other electronics to programmatically have it go back and forth and advance things. And it's really advanced. If you look on YouTube for like an automated fly shuttle uh, loom, you'll probably find it. The best examples are sadly like $20,000 plus because uh, they're actual production looms. Uh, you can, every now and then, uh, like you can, s some of them are even like from the, th like the turn, of the cent uh, tw turn of the 20th century, you know, like they're relatively old used to make denim. Um, some of those are still in production use today to make, like it's in, in particular in Japan, there's this whole um, group of weavers, they're, they're, I mean, it's a, they're companies, but they make uh, like really expensive denim for ex really expensive denim jeans. And they maintain these old looms from like the heyday of denim uh, that uh, automate the whole process. And when the part breaks, they either fabricate the part or get it from a sp one of the spare antique looms that they're doing. Same thing kind of goes for um, antique French lace weaving, uh, where they have the same sort of thing where they maintain all these old cast iron Victorian era looms uh, that are automated. But in particular, I would love to automate weaving kind of. And I kind of really like the separation. Like one of the reasons I, s I got into weaving was because it was completely manual. Like I don't even have an electronic uh, bobbin winder. I got one of those Swedish hand cranked ones because I, I like to have at least one thing I could do with no electricity, right? And so I can, when I sit and weave, I'm sort of like unplugging from all of that stuff and it's very meditative to kind of just like throw the shuttle back and forth and make fabric. So if I did that, it would be like a separate thing. That's kind of why I was excited on the machine knitting part because I'm like, that's, that's the knitting world over there. Like I'm a, kind of partially a weaver, so I will, you know, I'll stick over here with the manual stuff. All right, any another question? Uh, so you have uh, Yeah, so, so the question had to do about yarn thickness because these circular knitting machines have a range of yarns that they are optimal in and then a range of yarns that they're not. Um, and so, for example, the larger knitting machine is sort of the optimal head, largest you could go is about worsted weight uh, for knitters. Is, um, and then, because like you go to a store now, it's all sort of aimed at knitters, so it's all named after that. Like I'm used to like numbers because I'm a weaver, but uh-oh, it died. Wake up. All right. Oh, no. Oh, well, you saw the slides. It doesn't, it's not the end of the world. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so the bigger one would be worsted weight. I think worsted weight for this one would be a little bit too much, but it would, it would kind of work. But the, the key is for it to be relatively consistent thickness. So for this, the 22 hook one's more designed for socks. So I, would go, I wouldn't go any uh, thicker than DK. Um, I have, most of, my c most of my stash is DK or smaller for stuff. I have some worsted, but like I, went, I wouldn't go any thicker for, for my scarf. Um, I have a lot of thinner than that yarn though. So I have like a lot of what they would call lace weight. Um, and in those cases, sometimes I would, d I would have to double it up uh, so that it would be thick enough because I, it really, for this, th I defaulted the kind of sock weight uh, for this because it's kind of made for socks. And so it, the other thing is um, this knitting machine, like I had to add this to this uh, design, but the circular knitting machines also have a tensioner that sticks out that has a couple of different holes. And yeah, you, you can adapt, you can adjust for different yarn thicknesses by which and how many of those holes you use. And some of that's a trial and error. And some of it's also a function of the yarn. So some yarn is just uh, grabbier, I guess. Um, it has to do with, it has to do with twist. It has to do with what it's made out of. Is it super wash or not? Things like that, that can cause it to be slicker. Um, and sometimes if it binds a little bit, you can have problems too. So it just, it's a trial and error.
Yeah, so the question was, uh, was there still trial and error uh, on my case with attention, even knowing that about that? And so, I mean, in my case, I knew I was gonna sit somewhere in the middle uh, to be safe. Uh, and I, t I did test, I tested it first with a couple, I wanted to find the upper end, so I put some worsted weight in there to see what would happen. And of course, it was like hard to turn and it, it like strained the stepper motor, right? And I knew lace weight was too small, you would get this like really spindly little tiny scarf. And so yeah, somewhere between DK and sock for me, like had the best result. Um, but yeah, it definitely took trial and error with the tensioner. I ended up running it through all the tensioners on mine uh, because the way I designed it, because I kind of, I like the angle it entered into the hooks, the way it grabbed. Um, but I also designed it in such a way that you didn't have to. If you dealt with a, a, thicker, a thicker yarn, you could skip a couple of those and get away with it. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. So the, the question is, when I'm making the scarf over time, it gets a twist in it, and why does it get a twist in it? It gets a twist when I hang up the bottom of the scarf on a hook so the cats don't get it. Um, and so when it's hung, the, the, the circular knitting machine is doing a full, uh, two full rotations in a day, and the scarf that's coming out of it is rotating because the, the thing it's coming out of is rotating. So if you were to look up front here, you'd see this big circular like a clock hand. And so if you imagine if you imagine a clock that you would attach a string to, right, and kind of hold the string like out from the clock. So well, from your perspective, there's a clock here and I'm holding a string out this way and you just hold it and you put it on the minute hand. Every time that minute hand goes around, it's gonna add one single twist to that yarn. Um, and every day it's going to add, or every hour it's gonna add 60, or uh, every hour it's gonna add one twist to that yarn and every day it's gonna add 24 twists to that particular piece of yarn if you're holding it out. In this case, instead of it being out, it's in. So the scarf is being formed on the inside of the machine. It's coming out the bottom, but it's being formed behind this circle. So it just, it adds a, it just naturally adds two full twists to that scarf in, in 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Any, I can do knitting questions, but I can do weaving questions too. Uh, yeah. Oh, so the question is, have I considered adding a, a sensor to sense the binding? Um, I haven't. Uh, that's, that'd be kind of an interesting addition. I, honestly, if I were gonna modify it too much, I would probably also wanna just put like a higher quality knitting machine that had higher tolerances, so I didn't have to worry as much about binding. Because even I've like, I added lubrication in different parts and things like that to try to improve it, and it kind of did. But ultimately, it just comes down to you have non-precision parts that are kind of floating back and forth, and just every now and then they just get in the right sweet spot to kind of bind a little bit. It's just low tolerances. So, um, any other questions? All right. Well, if you have other questions, we can. I'd love to talk about basically everything in this, uh, so we can talk outside. Thank you very much.